Hello, I'm Eric Liu. I'm the executive director of the Aspen Institute's program on citizenship and American identity. I'm also the CEO of Citizen University, and uh, it is just a thrill to be in conversation with my friend and uh, an inspiration, uh, Claudia Rankin, poet, essayist, playwright, uh, author most recently uh, of this wonderful book, Just Us, An American Conversation, uh, which I would say is a heavy book in, in two ways. Uh, it, it's a heavy object, like it's a solid book made of beautiful paper with uh, images and photographs and uh, great care taken in the production of the book. Uh, and of course, its subject is um, itself not light uh, because the subject is uh, on through one lens, race in America, uh, through a more focused lens, whiteness and Americanness. Uh, and whether those are the same and whether those are detaching from one another. Claudia, um, welcome. Oh, Eric, it's so wonderful to see you. Always a pleasure. You know, the, 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 you call the book an American conversation, um, and yet you also use the word interrogating. And that's, I think, quite on purpose. So much of what's in the pages is you interrogating others, but also you interrogating yourself and you being interrogated. Um, and, and many candid reflections, whether it's encounters um, on an airplane uh, or discussions with people who, with whom you would have assumed you were aligned uh, and you suddenly realize one way or another, um, oh, maybe there's a misalignment or a misapprehension uh, of, of where we stand and what we bring into uh, a room. And I think one of the things that is so moving about the book is that it is this, um, you know, the lens I'll use is kind of Buddhist, almost Taoist, kind of just um, you know, the, the phrase you use, the, the, the quotidian of disturbance. You dive into the quotidian of disturbance, that daily feeling of asking questions, asking, how did I handle this? Asking, how did this person handle how I handled this, right? Um, and, uh, and so it's very, it reverberates out. Um, what has been, what have you learned uh, in the course of sharing these ideas uh, about your own place and position in this ecosystem of power um, as it is color coded in the United States? Well, I think the most um, positive thing I've learned is that we can take it. We can actually take these conversations in the sense that it will not destroy friendships if they are friendships. And uh, many of the people um, who I have engaged with inside the conversations that are represented in Just Us we now have even deeper conversations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it came from the, the sort of taking apart close reading of everything that we were saying. And so that, that's been um, good, good. It doesn't mean that we won't have other moments where we stumble and stutter and um, um, have to sort of reassess. But at least we have a groundwork that it's not the end of anything. Um, so that's good. The other thing I learned was that there's some, there are a number of phrases that are sort of um, send us in the wrong direction. And one of them is white privilege. Hmm. I think that phrase um, allows people to divert from thinking about the construction of whiteness or blackness into economic privilege. And so often, especially with white men, I get, you know, I've worked hard for what I have, et cetera, et cetera. So I now use the term white living because, you know, because that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about my ability to want a life where I can just walk out my door, go to the store, buy what I want, come back home without being, without, you know, being racially profiled or um, having surveillance um, even at my own front door. Um, so I think people, at least some of the people that I've been talking to are beginning to see the difference between the two. And that's something I would not have come to had I not, as they say, pushed the moment to their crisis, you know, it's mm -hmm. crisis. Um, and that probing, that idea that um, you came to learn that white living, that might be a better way to phrase this and frame this than white privilege, 
Um, well, it brings to mind a couple of things. I mean, at Citizen University, we have this slogan, live like a citizen, uh, which whatever your documentation status might be, uh, whatever, however you might enter into this country, to be able to live like a citizen and have voice and have agency and have power and have dignity, um, what you're describing in a way is live like a white. Uh, live like you were white. And that idea that that is not available to all um, is the aha moment that you're able to awaken in a lot of people who call themselves white, right? When no. Well, you know, I think in a way you're right that it does come down to live white, like a white, but, but, um, but I really want us to live like a human, <laughs> like, you know, like human beings who are citizens of this great country. Um, and it just so happens that white people have that available to them and others do not. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things um, that you quote in here along the way is uh, something that LBJ said to a young Bill Moyers, uh, and I'll roughly paraphrase, but, uh, um, you know, I think he said, if, and, and he, he said this not in praise of the sentiment, but just as a candid recognition of it in politics, that if you can convince the lowest white man that he's uh, better than the highest black man, uh, you can pick his pockets. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can convince him he's superior, in fact, you can empty his pockets. Um, and what that quote illuminates in part is again, what you were alluding to a moment ago, which is the conflation of color and class um, uh, and, and caste in a way. Um, and uh, you know, when you have these conversations or when you had them originally about white privilege and white men, for instance, resisted, um, uh, the reaction is very telling, but I've worked hard for everything I got. Um, and you quote Brett Kavanaugh in his Supreme Court confirmation hearing saying that, you know, to that effect. Um, but uh, it's a non sequitur in part. One can both have benefited from inherited unearned privileges and work their butt off, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, and it, that conversation unfolds with a certain valence among people of privilege, elite circles, highly educated. Um, but when it comes to working class uh, white people um, who feel the pinch and the crunch of economic injustice and the, the price of globalization. Um, whiteness pays what Du Bois, what David Rodiger, what others have called a wage, a psychological wage, right? Um, and how have you found it possible in talking to white people who consciously or not hold on to the wages of whiteness to let go of that, to realize that it, it's not a zero sum thing, that if they open it up, th this greater humanity uh, is available to them rather than, something, ra rather than simply something's getting taken uh, from them and their last form of social standing gets e uh, eliminated. Well, I think the people I am in conversation with um, who are friends are people who, many of whom have done this kind of um, work for themselves already. So it's not difficult for them to take another step towards um, thinking about negotiating their own pr um, privileges and whiteness and living uh, with, you know, in conversation with me. The people I approach, um, blindly, like the men in, in airports, I think those people find these conversations novel because they haven't actually had them previously. And, um, and when, that, when the first um, essay in the book um, with the white men on the plane was published in the New York Times, one of the things that happened was I received um, two, over 200 letters like old fashioned letters saying, mm -hmm. um, this is what my life looks like. And I don't understand why you say this thing or that thing or that thing. And, um, and that was, you know, that's interesting to me because I think people are really struggling with um, what it is they don't get like why I think something and they don't understand why I think it and, and why they think something and they think I find it antagonistic. And so I think as a culture, we have to understand that the, the culture has made us into these things that are um, segregated and um, pushing forward in ways that will lead us to greater apartheid. And so we're just gonna to have to stop and, and start again in a certain way. 
one of the ways in which you do extend that invitation though, it's not an invitation only to contemplation, it's an invitation to, to various versions of what would you do, kind of moral quandaries or dilemmas. You describe one situation where you're at a dinner party, where the only, you're the only black person at the dinner party. Um, and the conversation unfolds where you, you want to, um, and choose in fact to um, do the non-socially lubricant thing and say, hold on a second, wait. Um, uh, on something that that, uh, that that provokes you around the, these assumptions about race, um, and uh, in that essay or in that passage of the book, you you talk about the trade-off between being right and being in the room. Exactly. I mean, uh, there is a cost to speaking, and I don't want to pretend that there's not. You know, and um, and in that case. Um, that was a dinner party where people were talking about the 2016 election and the, the constant insistence that um, our sitting president ran on um, economics became more and more insulting to me. And, and, and so that's a, you know, a situation where I decided I was gonna push. And, and then I, you know, somebody said, maybe you went too far, but I went as far as I could. <laughs> is how I'd like to think about it. Um, and, you know, I've never been invited back to that house since. And um, um, so there are, you know, there are consequences, but that was a moment when I felt like I needed to take it. One of the ways we often frame it in our work is just the, is about the, is when you take stock of the power you have, in your case, the power of voice, the power of that position, when anyone takes stock of that, the power they may hold uh, and sees it clearly, you face a very binary choice of whether you're going to hoard it or circulate it, right? And you made a choice there to circulate it, spend some of that capital, uh, even if it meant to the consequence might be that you wouldn't be invited back. And, um, and this, is, this raises a question that I think is woven throughout the book uh, in different ways. Even though you talk about collective systemic ills, you talk about history in a way that situates us not just in the perpetual now, but the, the, the through line question is, how do we move from individual level heart work to collective change? Mm -hmm. And how, how do you mean in the framing of this book to, if not answer that question, to invite us to um, reckon with it? Well, what I wanted the book to do is take intimacy, um, those intimate conversations, and first of all, ask the question, what are conversations? You know, when you and I are talking, what are we doing? We're building something between us, perhaps, you know? And, um, and what do we want from these moments? And then I wanted to then almost create an autopsy of the conversation so we could see um, where it where it went, literally, where it went, and then show how what seems like a um, inconsequential moment is tied to systemic patterns in our country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a child gets called violent in class. You might think, well, that's one kid in a school somewhere, and well, you know, but, but then you look over to the Verso side of the page and you can see that institutionally, this is something that has gone on um, so that even um, children in preschool begin to understand the social capital of whiteness and the criminalization of blackness um, from the get-go. And so that was really the intention of the book to take the microaggressions, which is still racism, but the microaggressions and to open them out to the, the long history of systemic violence that has been done to black people. I think the book arriving at this moment means that for certain people, this is not the book for them right now because they want a solution. This book has no solutions. They want um, um, direction, how to be an anti-racist. You know, even Kennedy's book is a great book, but this is not that book. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are other books that they can go to. 
And, you know, thank God we have a democracy and books are not yet banned, <laughs> you know, so they can make these choices. But I think for those readers who are able to understand that institutions are made up of people and that people will have to, it sounds a bit corny, but change how they think about the things they think about, but <laughs> in a way, in order for us to actually meet. Mm. That kind of work is close to, you know, it's, it's close. Mm. It's, it's, it's word by word, it's stitch by stitch, it's thought by thought, and you cannot jump it. The opportunity that you're describing ultimately in this book is one of the imagination. Could we imagine a different kind of coalition? Mm -hmm. right? one, one that is not centered on that color-coded um, allocation of power. Um, exactly. And that work of imagination, um, you know, there, there's so much that you, you talk about in here. And, and what if is, of course, the central question of all acts of imagination. And, um, and I think at the very first pages of the book, on page five, uh, how does one say what if without reproach, right? And that to me is kind of the central question of the project of the next bunch of years for us as mm -hmm. Americans. How do we invite a full people into the what if work of imagining without it feeling like it's reproach, without it feeling like it is damning some as sinners and others as saved? Um, and is it possible, right? And uh, you know, your work fundamentally, and the reason why, I don't know what genre you would put this book in. It's, it, it's <laughs> no art. genre. I guess nonfiction is where it's living. It's nonfiction, but it's poetry. It is imagery. It is, yeah. uh, you know, dream narration. It is history. Um, it is all these things melded. To, it is interior just reflection. Uh, and it is ultimately um, the external deposit of your interior imagination. Mm-hmm. Right? And you are showing us how to imagine in this way. And I guess the last question I want to pose to you, Claudia, is um, what other tools can you encourage us to use, whether it's other books, other ways of engaging people, to build more imaginative muscle, to be able to imagine a different way of being American that's not bound to an old power-laden notion of whiteness, uh, to imagine one that's inclusive, whether or not it feels like you might be losing something or gaining something, right? How do we, how do we build that imagination right now? Well, you know, I think I'm going to read you this little paragraph that I was reading an article today by Nina Lahani. Um, and she says, researchers reviewed 1.8 million hospital birth records in Florida from 1992 to 2015 and established the race of the doctor in charge of each newborn care. When cared for by white doctors, black babies are about three times more likely to die in the hospital than white newborns. This disparity halves when black babies are cared for by a black doctor. And then she goes on to say that they're, they're only 5% um, of doctors who are black. So when I read something like that, I mean, which is so killing in a way that, um, that three times more likely to die if the attending physician is white. I think that the other piece of this act of imagination has to be an act of interrogation. Um, you know, people have to begin to really ask themselves, why do I think the things I think? Why am I not listening to this black woman? Why am I dismissive of Serena Williams saying that she is not feeling well, that she has an embolism, that she, you know, while she's in the hospital. Why, I think white people have to slow down in a way <laughs> and become suspicious of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not cutting it to say, my intentions are good. 
And that is one of the things, this is why I use my own life as a Petri dish in a sense, you know, because for all of us, we are made by the culture. And we have to, I don't think these doctors want to kill black babies. But I do think that their unconscious assumptions around black people cause them not to listen, not to value, not to care on a certain level. So I, I think, yes, we need an imaginative, um, Robin Kelly calls it almost like a surreal leap into what is possible. But I also believe that we need to slow down and begin to interrogate how racism and a culture of white supremacist orientation has positioned us to distrust, disregard each other. I will close in turn by reading a final paragraph on the final page of Just Us. Um, you've been speaking throughout our conversation about close readings, close readings of texts, of situations, of uh, our society, uh, and of course of people. Um, and you write, our lives could enact a love of close readings of who we each are, the love of a newly formed, newly conceived one, made up of obscure but sensed and unnamed publics in a yet unimagined future. And then the very last line of the book, a couple of lines later is, tell me something, one thing, the thing, tell me that thing. Claudia, you have been telling us to tell us that thing in so many beautiful, powerful ways. And uh, I have, I talk about the imaginative leap. I have a deep, deep, uh, deep faith. It doesn't require a leap. It's just requires sitting here uh, that this book is going to transform our country uh, and our society over time. And it's going to sink in deeply uh, in many hearts um, of many Americans. And uh, thank you, Claudia, for this book, Just Us, and for this conversation. It's been wonderful just to be with you again. Uh, and I hope to see you again sometime soon, not in your Zoom prison or mine, <laughs> uh, but, uh, in the Free flesh. Zoom. But um, Eric, thank you so much. And thank you for all the work that you do at the Citizen University and in terms of having people understand their own power in this country. Thanks, Claudia. <laughs>